this week on Vaticano, we follow Pope Francis through celebrations in Rome on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Walk with us through the streets of the Eternal City in procession with the Virgin Mary. And take a look inside the Milk Grotto Shrine in Bethlehem as we continue to discover the true meaning of the symbols of Christmas. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. On December the 8th, the Catholic Church celebrates the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary. It's one of the most important Marian feasts on the liturgical calendar, marked by great celebrations around the world. In Rome, on this festive occasion, Pope Francis prayed the Noon Angelus Prayer with the faithful gathered in St. Peter's Square. In his address afterwards, the Holy Father reflected on the readings from the feast liturgy. The Pope said that in the book of Genesis, there's the first no said by man to God, and the consequence is that humanity lost its communion with God. But God didn't want to leave man. Therefore, he sent his son to become one of us. And this was made possible by saying yes. No represents sin, and this was a yes. It is a great yes, the yes of Mary at the moment of the Annunciation. Later in the afternoon, following the tradition established by his predecessors, Pope Francis traveled to the center of Rome, to Piazza Mignanelli Square, where he prayed before the statue of the Immaculate Virgin Mary located there. O Mary, our Immaculate Mother, on your feast day I come to you, and I come not alone. I bring with me all those with whom your Son entrusted me. In the city of Rome and in the entire world, that you may bless them and preserve them from harm. In his prayer, the Holy Father paid particular attention to the needs of families and workers. He also prayed for abandoned children and people who have lost hope and dignity. We need your immaculate heart for us to love freely, without secondary aims, but seeking the good of the other, with simplicity and sincerity, renouncing masks and tricks. We need your immaculate hands so that we may caress with tenderness and touch the flesh of Jesus in our poor, sick and despised brethren. Surrounded by thousands of pilgrims and tourists, the Pope blessed a wreath of flowers. This wreath was hung over the right arm of the Statue of the Virgin by the head of the Italian Fire Department. In the evening, Pope Francis also paid a visit to the ancient icon of Mary Salus Populi Romani, which in English means the protectress of the Roman people. Tradition has it that this icon was painted by St. Luke himself. The Holy Father shares a special love and devotion to the Virgin Mary. He never leaves Rome without visiting and praying at the Basilica of St. Mary Major, where this icon is kept. In Italy, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception is also a national holiday. Many beautiful events and celebrations happen in Rome. One of them is a solemn procession with the Virgin Mary of Fatima through the center of the city. This year, the procession was led by the prefect of the pontifical household and personal secretary of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, that's Archbishop Georg Ganswein. The procession started at 7 p.m. at the Church of Jesus and Mary, located on Corso Street, one of the busiest streets in Rome. From there, the procession headed towards the Basilica of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, where it ended with a solemn Eucharistic blessing. The Feast of the Immaculate Conception was officially established by the Vatican in 1854, when Pope Pius IX confirmed the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. However, the tradition already existed as far back as the 7th century. According to the dogma, all humans are born with original sin, but Mary was immaculate from the moment of her conception because God chose her and prepared her to become the Mother of Jesus, the Mother of God.
Now let me say a few words about freedom of speech and freedom of belief. As a Sikh, I believe we should all be free to believe whatever we wish, so long as it has no adverse effect on others. To put it lightheartedly, I don't mind anyone believing that the earth is flat, providing they don't try and push me off the end. In late November, the three-day Global Summit on Religion, Peace and Security was held at the UN in Geneva to address the spread of violent extremism, which manipulates and misuses religion to justify brutal violence against civilians. It feels as though we have all forgotten the lessons learned in the last century. This panelist cited the oppression of historic facts evidencing peace and coexistence between different religions. Where are these images? They are now buried in the legacy of our history. Instead, people are digging out, I'm talking here about Muslim figures, misleading their people, digging out for differences or points of tension. We have a wealth of common history together, freedom, of religion. So what do we do about it? Not what should we do about it, but what are we doing about it? Not to what do we put in a resolution, but what do we practice? What are our best practices? The Apostolic Nuncio to the UN Geneva moderated one of the panels. He emphasized that the rights to freedom of religion are indispensable. We can say that there is not humanity without religious freedom. Religious freedom does not guarantee perfect society, but the absence of religious freedom certainly guarantees very dysfunctional society. Everybody present at the meeting have the impression that we are moving ahead in two ways. First is that we understand better the importance of religious phenomena inside of general uh, social context. And on the other side, probably, there is a bigger responsibility of everybody, not only religious leaders, but also uh, social, political leaders, not uh, to manage such a delicate uh, question in a too populistic way. You know. This summit is evidence of the growing importance of religion in international politics. And for the UN, that means religious freedom and peace among religions because most people in the world are religious and the question whether the religions live together in peace in countries is of utmost importance not only for practicing the faith but for the well-being of the society altogether. In his address to the UN in 2015, Pope Francis called spiritual freedom, which includes religious freedom, one of the necessary minimum means of society. You In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. More on Vaticano begins now. Christmas is the brightest and most awaited festivity of the year. Families gather for Christmas Eve, houses are decorated with colorful lights, and our kitchens smell of cinnamon and oranges. People like Christmas for the special atmosphere, the music, the costumes, the decorations, but what's behind all these traditions and customs? We met with Professor Bernardo Estrada to find out more about Christmas. It's very important to keep the traditions of the Christmas because it's, maybe Christmas is the most celebrated feast all over the world. There are even yeah, some countries that are not Christian and they also have the feast of Christmas. Why? Because that has been the moment, the beginning of our salvation, the moment in which Christ our Lord came to the earth to save us from sins and to give us the eternal life. And that's why the symbols of Christmas are very important, because they are keeping the genuine, the original sense of Christmas. The date on which Christmas is celebrated is also highly symbolic. The meaning is rooted in the presence of light. As on the 25th of December, the days start to become longer, with light symbolically winning over darkness. 
Since ancient times, the Church has elected this date to highlight the fact that the true light of the world is Jesus Christ. Following the tradition of light during Advent in homes and in churches, there's a wreath with four colorful candles. There are some places in which the candles are of the same color, especially in Germany there are many places where they have the same color. But there are others in which the candles effectively are from different color. But the crown of Advent is an ancient tradition in which they are telling us that we are preparing to the big feast of Christmas, that with the Easter represents the two main feast of the, of the whole church, of the liturgy and of the ceremonies of the church. So the, the different color of the candles is also a way to show that not every Sunday is, is um, the same with the other. Every Sunday is different because one Sunday that happens is approaching us more closely to the, to the feast of Christmas. And then this, the symbol of the crown is the symbol of the king because Christ came to the earth yeah, to show us that he was a king. But especially the Advent crowns or Advent, Advent crown is a manifestation of our expectative, that the, the fact that we are waiting for the coming of Christ. The origins of the Christmas tree are very much debated. Father Estrada says that there's nothing strange in this symbol. It's a Christian symbol, even if some people believe that it's actually a pagan one. As fir trees stay green while deciduous trees lose their leaves in winter, so is Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. And therefore, the Christmas tree is a symbol of the eternal life and of Christ himself. Christmas has many symbols. Maybe the most important one is the crib, because in the crib was the representation that St. Francis Assisi did in a small country, a small village close to Assisi, whose name is Grecho. was the first time in which he put Our Lady with the baby Jesus, St. Joseph, and the two animals that were with him in the crib. So that was the classical representation of Christmas. How did the church represent the nativity before the first scene created by St. Francis? Father Bernardo Estrada says that for the first centuries, the symbol of Christmas was the adoration of baby Jesus by the three wise men. The oldest representation of the nativity was found on a second century Vatican sarcophagus. It depicts Mary with the child, the three magi, and the stars shining over them. The three magicians and the stars are collegated, are united, because in the Gospel we read that the three Magi saw the star and they went to Bethlehem saying, yeah, where is the king of the Jews? Because we have seen his star in Orient and we have come to worship him. So, the, but the Magi, the manifestation are representing not only that wise men that came from Orient to adore and to know the king of kings, Jesus, but also they are representing, for, on the other side, the manifestation of Jesus, not only to the Jews, but also with the pagans, the Gentiles. So that was the first manifestation of Christ. Christmas time is the most special time of the year. People become a little bit kinder and more attentive to each other on this day, showing how things can be different, as if on this very day God himself came to earth. At the UN Geneva earlier this month, the International Organization for Migration, the world's leading organization to ensure orderly migration, held their 107th session. In his intervention, the Nuncio of the Holy See pointed out that migration worldwide affects 246 million children. Of particular concern for the Holy See is the vulnerability of child migrants, to whom Pope Francis dedicated his measures for 2017 the World Day of Migrants and Refugees. Uh, this year, the Holy See would like to draw attention uh, to the problem of ch children migration, migration of the children. On January 17th, the Catholic Church celebrates 
the World Day of Migration, and this year was focused on the consequences of children migration. We have had uh, long-standing relations with the Holy See. Uh, I uh, am grateful in particular to the Holy Father for his personal engagement on the issues. Uh, my first uh, audience with him in October 2014, he made it quite clear to me that uh, he's engaged on the issue and expects me to be. Uh, basically said, you know, get down to Lampedusa and make sure you see the migrants. 14-year-old Mustafa from Syria came from a transit camp in Lesbos, Greece, to Germany, where he received his residency permit. The line between a migrant and a refugee is blurred. A rising number of countries say that migrants and refugees cannot be properly screened, and therefore an orderly migration is not guaranteed. <laughs> We need to respect national migration systems and policies, avoid taking a one-size-fits-all approach, and differentiate between the two concepts of migrants and refugees. To focus on the common needs of migrants and of refugees, the historic New York Declaration was signed by the UN in September this year. Germany suggested to integrate migrants and refugees into the job market for the mutual benefit of themselves, the host countries and countries of origin. For instance, many industrialized countries, including Germany, face severe shortages of skilled workers in a multitude of professions. Opening up certain skilled labor markets under full observation of international labor rights and national labor standards could provide a prospect of employment for to those who meet the professional requirements, including, by the way, sufficient language skills. In response to the large arrivals of migrants and refugees in Europe, the Order of Malta set up programs in Germany, Hungary, Austria, Bulgaria and Slovakia, which include material assistance, shelter, medical, juridical and administrative services and local integration. The most important thing is that big conviction of the Pope that migration should be treated as a social phenomenon and not only as a consequence of social crisis. One in seven persons is a migrant. Currently there are one billion migrants on the planet. To reject them is not a solution. Thanks for watching. Stick around for more on Vaticano. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. In the previous episode of Vaticano, we traveled together with the Pontifical Council Corunum and Aurora Vision to Africa and Italy to witness different works of mercy. In the nation of Burkina Faso in Africa, a Sahel Foundation project provided drinkable water to local people. In Italy, we witnessed the work of evangelization of the Nuovi Orizzonti community. Today, a few days before Christmas, we traveled to the Holy Land, to the birthplace of Jesus Christ. Leah Beltrami, the director and founder of Aurora Vision Society, is going to tell the story of the Milk Grotto Shrine in Bethlehem. The Holy Land is a difficult land, a land of contrast. Bethlehem is the place of the Nativity. And right here in Bethlehem, next to the Church of the Nativity, there's a very special place called the Milk Grotto. And this is the place where Mary breastfed baby Jesus. This sacred area has been venerated since ancient times. Today, it's also frequently visited by local people, be they Christians, Muslims, or Jews. This short movie titled Prayer tells the story of different women who came with their prayer intentions to the monastery located in the Milk Grotto. From then, in a few years, a perpetual adoration started, and the sisters of the Order of the Perpetual Adores arrived in the area. With the support also of the Pontifical Council Cor Unum, they have restored the monastery and the milk grotto, 
And day and night, these sisters take turns in adoration. One sixth century legend has it that the Virgin Mary was hiding in this cave during King Herod's slaughter of the innocents. While breastfeeding baby Jesus, some drops of milk fell onto the ground of the cave and the pink stones of this hill became white. Christmas is all the lights, it's busyness, it's constant bombardment from the media and noise. These sisters, who day and night just stay there in silence and pray, also in the milk grotto, they get to experience the real Advent, the inner silence in which one expects and longs for the coming and the birth of Jesus. La preghiera in questa terra santa mi ricorda momento a momento che devo pregare per coloro che con tanta carità vengono semplicemente a chiedermi di ricordarmi della pace. بؤمن بالذات الإلهية وبالنسبة لي الصلاة كتير مهمة نابعة من القلب بتكون وبالنسبة لي الصلاة لازم تكون وجهة أكتر شيء للأطفال اللي بيكونوا عايشين مرحلة كتير صعبة بيكون صعب على الإنسان البالغ والعائل إنه يواجهها مثل الحروب اللي بتصير واللي بنشوفها حاليا في زمن نحتاج للدعاء بغض النظر عن مختلف الديانات لأنه كل الأديان المختلفة في العالم ولا دين بيحط على الكره والحقد كل الأديان بتطلب السلام السلام بين الشعوب خصوصا عندنا فلسطين لازم إحنا تخطينا مرحلة الحقد والكره خلص لازم نعيش مع بعض بكفي الأطفال يموتوا بكفي النسوان يترملوا بكفي البيوت تنهدم מתפללת כל יום לפחות תפילה אחת, מבקשת מהקדוש ברוך הוא אל רחום וחנון, שישמע את תפילת עמו ישראל והעם כולו בכל התפוצות, יהודים, נוצרים, מוסלמים, יביא שלום בינינו, ייתן לנו לב רחב ומלא לאהוב אחד את השני, לסלוח אחד לשני, כמו שהוא סולח לכל משוגותינו. כשאני מתפללת, אני אומרת תודה על מה שיש לי, ואני מבקשת את כל מה שאני יכולה, על עצמי, על המשפחה שלי, על עם ישראל, על שלום בינינו. העולם נברא במילה, ולמילה יש כוח. זה הכוח המיוחד של התפילה.
Nourish my brothers and sisters with your maternal love. Hold them in a hug where they may find their peace. La preghiera per me monaca di clausura vuol dire pregare senza stancarmi mai. Si prega per coloro che hanno bisogno, per i nostri fratelli musulmani, per i nostri fratelli ebrei, dei nostri fratelli cristiani qui a Betlemme, che soffrono, che sono perseguitati. Prego per i soldati, per quelli che sono al checkpoint, per quelle famiglie che vogliono andarsene via perché non trovano soluzione, per i giovani, per chi non conosce Dio. La preghiera anche per noi, per me, vuol dire vivere nella comunione con Dio, con coloro che vivono nel mio cuore perché si affidano alle mie preghiere. Si ringrazia a Dio per la sua misericordia infinita. La preghiera, infatti, è una vera e propria missione. Non è un mezzo devoto per ottenere da Dio quel che ci serve. Se fosse così, sarebbe mossa da un sottile egoismo. La preghiera è un'opera di misericordia spirituale che vuole portare tutto al cuore di Dio. La preghiera è una forza che muove il mondo. Thank you.